David Rothman is next from Basic Skills, um, author recently of a textbook, which looks wonderful. He's going to read to us a different selection today. Please welcome David Rothman. Thanks. I promise not to read from the textbook. So. Um, uh, last summer, I was trying to write, and I, I was in New York City. It was really hot. It was, one, it was kind of like today. And I couldn't think of anything to write, trying to write a short story. So I just got in the car, and I drove upstate New York. Um, can I yeah, raise this? How does that work? Right here. Sorry. Otherwise. Yeah, I think so. That feels a lot better. Anyway, so I just got in the car, and I drove upstate. And um, it was, it's really great to get out of New York City sometimes, you know? So I wrote a short story called Guided by Voices, and then um, I was lucky enough, I won a prize for it, and it's going to be published in a really nice journal called Glimmer Train. And then I said, well, maybe I'll just write a whole novel. You know, you get into your, you create a character, you get to like your characters, and you don't want to say goodbye to your characters. So right now I'm in the middle of um, a novel, same title, Guided by Voices. And last night my wife, I was talking to my wife, she said, are you crazy? You cannot read chapter eight of a novel because the, your audience hasn't read the first seven chapters. So how are they going to understand what you're talking about? Why would they want to hear chapter eight of a novel? So I have to listen to my wife. That's a good question, actually. So um, let me just, I'm going to say, like, for two or three minutes, I'll just say the five things you probably need to know to enjoy the 10 minutes of chapter eight that you're going to hear. So here's what you have to know. Um, you would have to know that the main character is a guy named Boris. He's an immigrant from Belarus. Belarus is right next to Russia. They speak a dialect of Russian. Uh, the capital's Minsk. Anyway, he came to New York, upstate New York, not New York City, upstate, far from New York. And uh, he came with his family, his wife and his six-year-old son. And he came at the worst time imaginable, which is now. You know, it's a recession. It's not a great time to come here. He had a lousy job. He lost his job. And at this moment in the story, he's very desperate. At one point, uh, a few weeks earlier from chapter 8, he, he met some Mormons, you know, the Mormon church. He met some Mormons on the street, and they spoke to him, and he, he kind of got convinced to go to their Mormon meetings, although he wasn't sure if he really wanted to be a Mormon. Um, so you need to know that. He loves a band called Guided by Voices, which is sort of a cult band from the 90s, band from Ohio. I don't know why he likes this band, but he likes this band. Um, his wife's name is Marina. She teaches piano because they need the money. They're so desperate. Uh, she'd rather do something else. She's very skepti skeptical of religion and, his, and her husband's liking of the Mormons. Um, they have a six-year-old son, I think I mentioned, named Sasha. He has a condition called pectus excavatus, which is like an inverted rib cage. I'm not sure if you really need to know that, but <laughs> I told you. Um, one, of the, one of the Mormons that Boris met, his name is Doug. Um, Doug was really nice. He met more, uh, Boris on a hilly street, stopped him, asked him questions about God. That's how it starts. Uh, the setting of this scene is in a Mormon center, and Boris is going for a meeting for new recruits for the Mormon church. And this, uh, the elder Brent, the, uh, sort of like the minister, is giving a, uh, a sermon. So I'm going to read one paragraph or two from chapter 7, and then I get to read chapter 8. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and here today, you are, you are who are soon to be baptized into the church of Latter-day Saints must pay heed to Smith's words. For it is these words which justify the missionary work you will soon embark upon. Smith continued, I can taste the principles of eternal life, and so can you. They are given to me by the revelations of Jesus Christ, and I know that when I tell these words of eternal life, as they are given to me, you taste them, and I know you believe them, and others will believe you, inductees, when you spread the word. God bless all of you. Amen. After 10 minutes of reflection time at your pew, Elder Schaefer and his assistants will usher you into the training center banquet hall for a question and answer lunch buffet, and there will be some time for more reflection and prayer. Chapter 8. Boris sat paralyzed in his pew, mesmerized by the bishop's words. 
Elder Brent's eyes had pulled him in like a Baba's embrace on a dark, uncertain night. His words comforted Boris like a fresh bowl of borscht topped with sour cream. They relaxed his fears as his favorite childhood pillow once had. Boris had had to pee the whole time during the sermon and had struggled to maintain his equilibrium, imagining blood spurting from his swollen bladder as the bishop spoke of eternal sacrifice. Now he didn't have to pee at all. Strange how that happens. Had the Mormon spirit entered his urinal tract? <laughs> Boris had also been wondering what the sacred underwear beneath Bishop Brent's black slacks looked like. He had read in one of his Mormon Google searches that all Mormon elders had to wear sacred undergarments in, in temple. He imagined Marina's scorn if she ever caught him putting on such an item, which he would have to if he went through baptism. He heard her voice in the silence of the reflection period. Borushko, she would say, what is this stupid looking magic underwear all about? You have become a fool in America. Boris looked around at the inductees to his right and left, some of whom he had met during his first chat at the Mormon Center, at the elders in the front and back aisles, and at the tall bishop praying on the podium. The silence was beginning to make him feel uncomfortable. What did he know of silent moments and reflection time? When Boris had a free moment to himself, he would maybe fill the space with a Guided by Voices song, singing, marching toward darkness, or perhaps find a safe corner and send a tweet to his friends or to a college uh, buddy back home. Of course, as a Mormon, these two activities would be strictly off limits. Boris turned around and smiled at Elder Doug, standing in the back with another elder he didn't know. Doug had invited him to this pre-baptism welcome and chat and had promised that he would find time to discuss a job opportunity in telecommunications. Boris needed a new job really badly. There was nothing more humiliating than when he had bought a bag of groceries the week before with food stamps, and Sasha had noticed and asked why he was not paying with cash. His mother would be expecting some US dollars soon from her rich son in America. He could barely afford his Sunday calls to Minsk. Boris thanked Jesus and John Smith, too, for his mother's good health. He could not afford to take care of her hospital bills God forbid. Marina had chastised him when he told her he would be spending the afternoon at the Mormon training center. You can't be wasting time with such silly distractions. You need to work harder on finding employment. What Marina didn't understand, despite his many efforts to explain it to her, was that this was his means to solid employment. Doug would live up to his promise and Boris would be on his way. Latter-day Saint networking had taken many before him to the top. Even John Marriott, the hotel mogul, had started out as a modest Mormon elder and had worked his way up the Mormon ladder. Boris looked around again and it seemed that everyone but him was deep in prayer. The truth was that now that Elder Brent had fell silent and was no longer passionately orating on the power of God and the duty of man to follow the prophet, a sense of reason had returned to him and the heavy-handed righteous ideas that had been spoken seemed somehow ridiculous, even trivial. With his head back on earth, Boris might even agree with Marina that this type of we-know-the-truth dogma smelled of what they had experienced with the party back in Belarus. A bell rang signaling the end of the reflection period. Boris turned and Doug was now walking towards him down the central church aisle. He patted Boris's shoulder and offered one of his signature strong handshakes. Doug had it all, Boris thought. He was genuinely a nice guy with a stable job, a nice home, a beautiful wife and children, and an American sense of self-assurance. Great to see you here, Boris. You've got a terrific lunch coming. How'd you like the sermon? Boris stuttered in response. He had not spoken since the sermon started. I, I like beautiful words, Joseph Smith, very good. I knew you'd see the light, Boris. Yet Boris prayed that Elder Doug could not see through him to the many thoughts he was hiding. Doug shook Boris's doubting hand again and introduced him to the other elder he had been standing with in the back. The man was bald and had to be, a double, had to be double Doug's age. Boris noticed that the guy could not control his right eye, had some kind of twitching problem. He wore the identical black suit as Doug. Boris, this is Elder John. 
for a smile, trying to ward off the skepticism still buzzing around his head. Why couldn't he be like Doug, a man without a cynical bone in his body? Boris considered that Doug had never stepped foot in Belarus. He shook Elder John's hand. Doug tells me you wanted to work in telecommunications. Sounds great. Have you ever heard of the Boonesville International Corporation? Boris hesitated and looked over at Doug and nodded. Yes, I hear good things about this, uh, your corporation. I like it. Elder John stepped back, and Boris noticed his twitchy smile fading. There was a strange silence, and Boris wondered if he had said the wrong thing. Doug stepped forward and laughed. Boris is going to take intensive English classes right here at the uh, Mormon Training Center starting next week. Is that right, Boris? Yes, yes, I take English. Elder John's twitch calmed, and his smile returned. Well, great to meet you, fellow. You'll soon be full baptized Latter-day Saint and a true American as well. With that, Elder Doug and John turned to greet another inductee, leaving Boris alone to wrestle with his demons, the same dangerous thoughts that had erupted moments earlier. Religion had never been a big part of his life. Boris pictured his mother with her hocus-pocus rituals. He could see her now, gently rubbing the small portrait of St. Vladimir on her bed table, always three times with the full palm of her hand, or lighting votive candles on the anniversary of a relative's death. He, like his brother Yuri, who had little else, he had little else in common with, would protest mother's primitive superstitions. Boris looked up at the altar and down at the many rows of black books, books of Mormon resting in the pews. How were these rituals any different from the primitive habits of the Orthodox back home? What was his connection to this questionable New World religion? Boris asked himself, why should a modern Belarusian immigrant in upstate New York care about a set of beliefs held by some super American guy named John Smith from a long time ago in Ohio? Boris could hear Marina's ghost echoing the same questions in, in his ear. Just at the moment when Boris was considering turning toward the heavy wooden doors and walking away from the whole experience, he felt a gentle tapping on his back and turned quickly to face the unexpected towering figure of Bishop Brent himself, who seized the moment by grabbing Boris by his two shoulders, and with his face just inches from Boris's, stared deep into Boris's eyes. Boris felt the bishop's piercing blue eyes judging him. Young Boris. And Boris felt for an instant that this man must truly have magical powers in guessing his name correctly, until it dawned on him that the bishop had simply read his name tag. Boris could feel the bishop's warm breath on his neck, and his sharp gaze felt like the injection of a spell. We all have our moments of, of trial and doubt, and let me tell you, these moments will pass. You can ask God himself if everything I said is not true. Take the gospel upon you and embrace it. Embrace Jesus' salvation. Embrace our prophet's vision so that you and your family can share in this peace on earth. Boris didn't know what to say or what to do. He couldn't move, and the position the bishop had him in reminded him of something he had seen on worldwide wrestling on European satellite. The bishop's powerful arms held him in place, and in his direct presence, the themes of his powerful sermon came back into Boris's viewfinder. During the sermon, he had not understood every righteous word emanating from Elder Brent's stern lips, the meaning of some of the stronger terms like archangel, exaltation, and immortality, had hung in the air for a while and popped out at him moments later with his English. Boris had wanted to write these beautiful sounding words in his father's little black book, which he had tucked inside the free brown leather valise Elder Doug had so kindly offered him during his first tour of the Mormon Training Center earlier in the week, set down next to brochures such, with titles such as Healthy Family Living and Living with Prayer. Yet during the sermon, sitting in the second row with Elder Brent's gaze upon him, Boris didn't dare challenge the bishop's expectation of completely dominating his audience's attention. Boris had sat still as an owl. The bishop released his grip and gave a now sweating Boris a big handshake. You have the spirit, son. I just felt it. To Boris, it felt like half an hour had passed under the bishop's spell. But according to his iPhone, which he had secretly glanced at just before Elder Brent surprised him from behind, only about a minute had gone by. Elder Schaefer, a well-built lawn man with a crew cut who couldn't have been a day older than Boris, smiled big and waved to Boris and the other inductees. We cannot fill our souls without first filling our stomachs. Let's share a nice lunch together. 
Remember, bathroom visits are limited to five minutes maximum. This is a Mormon rule. Boris, his head spinning 100 kilometers an hour with images of heaven and hell, both inspired and threatened by the big thoughts the bishop had tried to cement in his brain, followed Elder Schaefer and the dozens or so silent inductees out the heavy mahogany temple doors into a long, brightly lit hallway. The walls were sparsely, sparsely decorated. A large photo of dandelions blossoming hung on one side above a water fountain. A colorful, digitally designed poster of a mother and father, son and daughter, and a family embrace stood on the other. There were no crosses, no icons of Jesus, Mary, or even St. Nicholas, Vladimir, or Stefan, his mother's three favorites, and the only one Boris knew on a first-name basis. There was no religious imagery whatsoever. And as they stepped through a small glass door and followed Elder Schaefer into another corridor, Boris considered that if he hadn't just sat through one of Prophet John Smith's historic sermons and been personally shaken and stirred by the bishop himself, he could have mistaken this place for a more sanitized version of one of Minsk's central medical centers. After their first chance meeting at the break of dawn, Elder Doug had stopped by the Moisheyev home unannounced a few days later with Elder Scott, and the visit had created a scandal. And you know what? I'm going to skip this part because I want to read the ending. Is that okay? Okay. You have to wait till next year it gets published. Okay. All right. Oh, yeah. All right, I'll finish with this. Now Elder Schaefer led them into a large circular banquet hall with two very long tables on each side of, a, of the largest display of food Boris had seen since his wedding day at the Grand Minsk Hotel. There was a salad area with every vegetable Boris had ever tasted and some he hadn't, a side dish table with all American favorites such as macaroni and cheese, mashed potatoes, coleslaw, and gumbo. There was rye bread. Boris's favorite food in the whole world, along with an assortment of other breads, such as pita, French bread, biscuits, white and whole wheat. The entree table stretched on in the direction of the dessert cart, and Boris read the titles of each dish labeled on laminated white cards. Meatloaf, roast chicken, pork loin, salmon steak, lasagna, lamb chops, vegetable stir fry, and lemon sauteed cod. Boris noticed that he was drooling onto his perfectly iron-white shirt, and looking around embarrassed, he wiped himself with the cloth napkin he had been offered upon entering the hall. He realized now, lost in the en these endless choices, the beautiful smells and colors of the meal that awaited him, how hungry he had been these last weeks. Marina made him ration this and share that and cut this and save the rest of that for Sasha. Boris stacked his huge white plate high with as much food as he could fit on it and rushed to sit down at the nearest table. An unattractive short woman immediately sat down next to him and put out her hand for him to shake. Boris tried to offer his hand in return but could not release the fork he gripped tightly in his right hand. My name Gloria Mancayo. Nice to meet you, Boris. I'm from Lima, Peru. Where are you from? Boris tried to smile with his full mouth of food. He did not want to appear impolite, but the act of eating consumed all of his attention. Nice to meet you. Let us enjoy this magical meal. No? I'm sorry. I eat now. Gloria smiled sympathetically at him. I understand you. We eat and talking soon. No problema. Boris looked up from his quickly diminishing pile of delicious food. There were perhaps a dozen other inductees, mostly men, mostly young, like him. He smiled again at Gloria, trying to express through gesture that he appreciated her warmth and kindness. He was simply hungry. He then realized that he was the only one who had, been, who had begun eating. Elder Schaefer jumped up in front of the banquet table. Before we break bread, let us bless this meal in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. May all your meals be blessed by God. Some kind of delicious tomato-based sauce dripped down the side of Boris's mouth. He glanced around at the others, holding their hands in prayer, their meals neatly untouched on their plates, and wished he could hide himself somewhere under the table. Enjoy this offering from God, and as you do, think of your family and your new Mormon family. You must work to bring your beloved family members into our flock. Do not fear their reaction. Boris couldn't stop. He stuffed, stuffed some meatloaf down his throat and thought of how much he feared Marina's reaction. You must cast them in, not cast them out. Boris eyed the dessert table. He would have to eat the apple pie and chocolate mousse without coffee. 
He could always grab a large coffee at the Dunkin' Donuts around the corner after the meal. Before you leave, please speak to me about scheduling your baptism date. Remember that you must first be present for four more chat sessions where you will, where you will discuss the Mormon pact with God before you can be baptized as a Latter-day Saint. Let us enjoy the sweetness of dessert as we review some of the sacrifices you'll have to make as a member of the Mormon church. Bathroom breaks in the temple must never be longer than five minutes. You cannot participate in any kind of gambling activity. You can never, ever consume coffee or alcohol. You cannot wear any tattoos. If you currently have a tattoo, it must be removed before baptism. You must keep your hair short and cut off any facial hair. You must fast on the first Sunday of each month and must pray for at least an hour a day or for three hours on Sunday. And for three hours on Sunday. Most importantly, all inductees must do their duty of missionary work. We will discuss the particulars of missionary work in more detail during your next chat sessions. We welcome you from the bottom of our hearts to this, our congregation of the Church of Latter-day Saints. Almost done. This list of rules and prohibitions had Boris sweating from his forehead and choking on his apple pie. His mind was consumed with dark thoughts again, and he considered finishing up his dessert plate and bolting for the door, running free out into the sunny afternoon, and perhaps heading for a Dunkin' Donuts for a hot cup of coffee. The Mormones saved my life. It was Gloria again, sitting next to him, distracting him from his escape plan. I was losted, illegal immigrant exploitation, and the Mormones helped me, saved me from dark. Yes, the Mormones. Yes, Mormons are nice. Boris didn't know what to say. He felt a stomach ache coming on. He would excuse himself graciously, head to the bathroom, and quietly slip out to the bus stop from there. Boris, looks like you enjoyed your meal. You had a pleasure of meeting Glory as well. It was Doug, smiling and self-assured as usual. Boris, can we speak for a moment over in the corner? Excuse us for a moment, Gloria. Boris was sure Doug was going to chastise him for rudely eating before the prayer over the meal was said. He stood up and followed Doug nervously to the doorway. Doug stood facing Boris, his back leaning on the wall. Elder John was impressed by you, Boris. He's offering you a full-time job with the Bonesville International Corporation. This is a strictly Mormon business based in Utah. You will, of course, have to take our free intensive English classes every day after work. Boris was speechless. He no longer felt pain in his stomach. You will be perfect in telecommunication sales. Our office is right here in Kingston, a few blocks away from here. The details have to be worked out, but you will receive a salary plus commission. Commiss? Doug laughed politely. Commission, Boris. That is, you'll receive a bonus over your salary based on how much business you bring us. Does that sound okay? Bonus. I like bonus. I work hard for bonus. Very good, Boris. We will talk more about the whole thing on the ride home. You do need a ride home. Yes, and Doug, I... What is it, Boris? Boris had to hold back the wave of tears coming from his eyelids. I thank you, thank you, thank you. Doug, I thank you, thank you. Now Boris was crying, and, and Elder Doug reached into his pocket to offer him a tissue. Doug put his hands on Boris's shoulder. You go wash up, and I'll meet you in the lot in five minutes. In the men's room, Boris found a stall and sat down with his pants on, weeping into his open palms. He couldn't wait to share the beautiful news of employment with Marina and Sasha. Tonight they would celebrate. On his way home, on his way out, after signing up for a late June baptism, Boris inconspicuously wrapped one piece of cheesecake and a handful of brownies in his cloth napkin and placed the package carefully in the front pocket of his only pair of dress pants. <laughs>